the authorities in Norway have threatened to remove our legal registration because of our scriptural beliefs and practices regarding disfellowshipping. They may pressure us to change our scriptural beliefs, but we're certainly not going to do that. Nope, he was wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses' practice of disfellowshipping has cost the group a lot of goodwill and money lately. The group was recently denied government funding in Norway after a drawn-out legal battle that witnesses ultimately lost. The TLDR is that disfellowshipping means shunning, and any baptized member is subject to the possibility of one day being shunned, since JW children are not only able but encouraged to get baptized, thus locking them into a lifelong contract with built-in punishments for ever leaving. The Nor Norwegian government said that that's a violation of human rights, and we're not going to give you free money to do that sort of thing. To be clear, Jehovah's Witnesses were not banned in Norway, just no more free money. But Watchtower really likes free money, so they're changing some things. We will no longer refer to unrepentant wrongdoers removed from the congregation as being disfellowshipped. In harmony with Paul's words recorded at 1 Corinthians 5.13, we will now refer to them as being removed from the congregation. That was from the August 2024 study edition of the Watchtower magazine. And while the entire magazine is dedicated to the subjects of discipline, shunning, and the persnickety rules surrounding sin and punishment, it only uses the word disfellowshipping one time. Just to tell members, uh, hey, we're actually not going to use that word anymore. If you don't know, The Watchtower is a publication studied by over 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses around the world every Sunday. And the August 2024 edition I just read from is, as I'm recording this, not yet officially on the website. The August 2024 Watchtower has thus been the subject of speculation since the aforementioned Norway decision. Shortly after losing their legal battle, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, possibly by sheer coincidence I'm legally obligated to stipulate, announced some changes to disfellowshipping in a, in my opinion, kind of confusing update on JW.org. This was posted on March 15th of this year of our Lord 2024, and way back then the governing body was still using old-timey words like disfellowshipping. Disfellowship into Individual. As I've covered in previous videos, this update did not actually change very much at all for rank and file members. It suggests the elders meet with sinners more times before disfellowshipping them, if that is necessary. If a shunned person visits the Kingdom Hall, witnesses have the choice to say hi to them for two seconds before going back to shunning them. And minors can't get disfellowshipped anymore unless they're really sinful or just flat-out apostates, meaning they think the religion is not the truth and they are saying so out loud. And in that case, it's the same old song and dance. If a disfellowship individual is a known apostate or someone who actively promotes wrongdoing, the elders would not visit him. Neither would individual Christians greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting. After all, those apostates sound like the sort of folks who start legal battles in order to hold people accountable for their crimes. Perhaps on their apostate computer blogs or social media. That's a quote from the magazine, the August 2024 Watchtower, that we're talking about today. It officially released on the website a few hours after I recorded this. And so I have a copy, because so does the entire internet, and I would say that the reasoning behind this decision, behind not saying disfellowshipping anymore, is clear. The governing body thinks it can pull some rhetorical trickery and lawyer-approved shenanigans to avoid further trouble in the courts and or losing them any more money. We've got to keep the governing body in Apple Watches, after all. I'll probably go through the magazine in its entirety in a future video or stream because I don't value my mental health or time, but in this video I'm just going to talk about what has changed, or what the governing body says they've changed, but haven't actually because they're liars. The first major change relates to the practice of marking. Marking has always been a pretty esoteric practice of Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, it happens, but conceivably you could go your whole witness life without knowing a marked person. Modern Witnesses are now likely to know many marked people or be marked themselves. So what am I talking about? Well, Watchtower explained. Previously we said that this, meaning the practice of marking, was direction to the elders. If someone continued to ignore Bible principles in spite of repeated counsel, the elders might give a a warning talk to the congregation. Thereafter, individual publishers would not socialize with the market one. Translation, at the midweek meeting, an elder would give a talk clearly aimed at someone in the congregation, and the talk would be given in a backhanded way, so everybody listening knew exactly who it was about. And the point was, this person we all know I'm talking about rhymes with 
Shmamantha, we should keep away from that person. They're marked. It's very culty. No surprise that they would want to change such a thing. But it's not a good change, in my opinion. In fact, I think it's going to make the religion a whole lot cultier. However, an adjustment is needed. Paul's counsel evidently refers to an action that individual Christians should take under certain circumstances. So there is no need for the elders to give a warning talk. Here we have a Watchtower catchphrase. Evidently. evidently. We used to do it one way, but evidently, evidently, we should be doing it another way. It's not that we were wrong before, it's that we're doing it a different way now. So evidently, what is this evidence? Well, it doesn't really matter, actually. Good witnesses will follow the direction, no matter what the evidence is. But Watchtower says, Keep this one marked, said Paul. The Greek word suggests taking special notice of this person. Paul addressed this directive to the whole congregation, not just the elders. Pretty... Tenuous logic, and I'm very tempted to go into all the problems with this, but I'm trying to stay focused. The point is this. So, individual Christians who might have noticed a fellow Christian disobeying inspired counsel would choose to stop associating with the disorderly one. In the before times, marking was a rare decision made by elders. Now it's up to each individual JW to mark whomever they want based purely on vibes. Alright, that was a little uncharitable. You might think, if you haven't read the rest of it, but I have, and I think I'm right because here's what it says. Did this mean that the person was treated as someone who was removed from the congregation? No, for Paul added, continue admonishing him as a brother. So individual Christians would still associate with the marked one at meetings and in the ministry, but they would not choose to associate with him for social occasions or recreation. Why? That he may become ashamed said Paul. As a result of the marking, the disorderly Christian might become ashamed of his conduct and change his ways. Gross. It's gross. Watchtower is further perpetuating their culture of public shaming. Really passive-aggressive public shaming. If you might have noticed a fellow Christian breaking the rules, give them the cold shoulder outside of church and door knocking. Now, Watchtower does give a caveat. Paul was not talking about those who differ from us in matters of conscience or personal preference, and he did not mean those who simply have hurt our feelings. Rather, Paul had in mind specifically those who deliberately chose to disobey clear God-given counsel. So don't go marking everyone willy-nilly just because you got your feelings hurt or just have a difference of opinion. But, as with most things in life, this made me think of Star Wars. Tell it to me in Star Wars. Well, it made me think about the way Jehovah's Witnesses view Star Wars on an individual basis. I was raised by Star Wars fans, and my parents loved Star Wars, so I was allowed to watch those movies as a kid. But some of my fellow junior JWs were not allowed to watch Star Wars. Their parents reasoned that the Force was just magic. And don't you know Watchtower says the Bible says that you're not allowed to consume any entertainment featuring magic? Because even though magic is fake, it's also from Satan somehow? This would be an example of a conscience matter. Witnesses can respectfully disagree on the satanicness of the space wizard movies like mature adults with no one getting disfellowship. Now, let's bring this new marking arrangement into it. Ugh. But I hate both those words, marking and arrangement. I made light of Watchtower's satanic panic energy around magic and witchcraft, but it's not a joke for Jehovah's Witnesses, I can attest. Is this toy magical? Mm-hmm. Caleb, who likes magic? Jehovah or Satan? Satan. Right. Magic is bad. That's why Jehovah hates it. Do you really want to play with something that Jehovah hates? The language they use is severe. True Christians should avoid such entertainment. One could argue, it, it's me, I don't know why I'm speaking in the third person, I would argue that a JW taking the doctrine seriously could view a Star Wars watcher as not a true Christian by that logic. And that means it's not a conscience matter, right? Because God's word, the Watchtower, is clear on this matter of witchcraft, and Star Wars literally has witches in it. So, what's stopping the anti-Star Wars JW from soft shunning the other person who's right and thinks Star Wars is cool, even no matter how many witches it has. That's sort of a silly example, but you can see how this sort of logic has the potential to create more ostracization and shame within the group not less. I imagine some Jehovah's Witnesses are going to try and spin the contents of this magazine as a sign the group is now more loving, 
more nuanced and less dogmatic. But no, this isn't the same thing as disfellowshipping, but disfellowshipping hasn't gone anywhere. They just call it something different. And now, on top of d removing people, members are given full permission to not make peace with their brother, to instead unilaterally decide to soft shun the person with the explicit intent of making them feel ashamed. And Watchtower can say this is something enacted only by individuals, I don't believe them. Since this is a personal decision, we would not discuss it with others outside of our immediate family. But of course, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, probably at least some of your immediate family are also Jehovah's Witnesses, and at the very least, your found family within the congregation are JWs, and folks in the organization gossip. If you make the decision for yourself to mark Sister Jones, and you just tell your family, that's not gonna stay in the family. Human nature and the basic social structure of Jehovah's Witnesses dictates that will leave the house at some point, and soon the whole congregation will know about it, or they'll know something's up, they'll know something's going up with this person, because uh, it seems like they're marked. Soon the whole congregation has marked someone, soft shunning them, without any explicit announcement to do so by the elders. It's efficient for the cult leader's culty purposes and ensures social pressure without legal liability. Uh, maybe. I think they get a little sloppy with this next part. Marking is said to be reserved for disorderly ones, people who commit sins that are not disfellowshipping offenses, as they used to be called before this one footnote in this one magazine. For example, a fellow Christian might refuse to work to support himself, although able, might insist on courting an unbeliever, or might spread device of talk or hurtful gossip. Those who persist in such a course are disorderly. First of all, spreading divisive talk can mean saying things like the governing body maybe aren't Jesus' personal earth assistance, which is one of those sins that can get you full-blown shunned, not just marked. But I was talking about legal shenanigans. For most of the article, Watchtower uses words like might. A Christian might mark someone, which is a clever way for Watchtower to deny responsibility for things they might tell their members to do. The governing body knows it's a command, the readers know it's a command, but courts, for example, could not prove that it's a command. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but given the delay in this magazine and Watchtower's history of using sneaky legalese to avoid responsibility, I think that's what they're going for here. In this one part, they just say it. It just kind of is a command. Today, if we notice a fellow Christian who shows such a disobedient spirit, we will make a personal decision not to associate with him for social occasions or recreation. We will make the decision. That sounds like doctrine to me. The first article in the magazine is just laying the track for all these changes via Jesus' sacrifice and your bog-standard evangelical stuff. And the article following this page on marking that we just read uh, mostly just recaps stuff that was released in the Governing Body update. I covered that in the stream. You can watch it. Links in the description, unless I forget. But then there's this, I don't know what you call it in the magazine, a bonus segment? What is this, the all worldly channel after the credits? The bonus segment, as I'm designating it, asks a question Watchtower pretends anyone cares about. When was the man in Corrin 3 instated? Now, for my never JW freaks who watch my channel for some reason, reinstatement is when a person is undisfellowshipped. Wait, we don't use that term anymore. Unremoved. They are reinstated as a Jehovah's Witness, and that means everybody gets to talk to them again and pretend like they never shunned them and none of this is weird. It would seem Watchtower is trying to cobble together some notion of a biblical precedent for how long people should be disfellowshipped for before they're allowed to be reinstated. How long should the punishment be? How long is Brother Schween gonna be in timeout for watching gay pornography despite being told not to do that three times by the elders? That is what this article endeavors to answer. Now, to be honest, I don't care about the Bible part of this at all, so I'm sorry if you wanted me to debunk it with facts and logic or whatever. But I may as well use this opportunity to address something I've kind of shifted my position on over the years of doing this channel. I have no interest in using the Bible to reason with Jehovah's Witnesses or disprove Watchtower doctrine. And that's because I don't think the Bible is a reasonable text. I don't think you should be using the Bible to reason about anything, let alone determining any sort of truth. Also, there are Christian XJWs who can do that better than me, and you can watch their stuff probably after this. But whatever you personally think of the good book, for cults, the Bible is just a device they use as a rhetorical trick to grant themselves authority and assert control. The scriptural application is reverse engineered to justify the rules and regulations they selfishly want to enact to keep their sheep in the pen. So let's see what Watchtower says the Bible says about reinstate. So I'm going to skip past all their reasoning for this guy in Corinth who 
they frame as a Jehovah's Witness who went through the modern day judicial process, although we are, maybe we won't call it that anymore. Spoiler alert. You can just get past that. Let's see what Watchtower says the Bible says about reinstatement. With such factors in mind, it seems reasonable to conclude that Paul urged the congregation to reinstate the repentant wrongdoer just a short time, perhaps only months, after he had been removed from the congregation. It seems reasonable to conclude. Perhaps only months. What if the Ten Commandments were written that way? It seems reasonable to conclude that perhaps thou shalt not kill, or you know, whatever. Leaves a lot of wiggle room, I'm saying. Also pour one out for my Louisiana listeners in public schools. But okay, while we're here, I'm just gonna do a quick nitpick corner. Why is it necessary to be so picky to be so fussy. Watchtower uses so many gosh dang weasel words in this bonus box. Right off the bat, it appears that the man was reinstated after a relatively short time. So the whole premise of this is based on Watchtower's hunch. But wait, there's more. He evidently wrote. It seems likely that he wrote. Perhaps in late summer or early autumn. Paul surely followed up quickly. So Paul likely wrote again soon. Wouldn't want to accidentally say that for sure we think something. So technically no one can really prove that we lied. Necessarily. All right, back to business. The next item is less of a change and more of what Watchtower might call a clarification. A clarification about how nice you should be when a sinner has been reinstated. Reinstatements are announcements at the meeting, usually right at the end, before the song. The chairman of the meeting gets up and reads off a piece of paper for some reason, even though it's just one sentence. Brother Schween has been reinstated as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And everyone claps. Now, because that's the new rules. It wasn't not the rules before, as you can see on the screen here. My understanding when I was a witness is that applause was supposed to be spontaneous, so and if it was somebody who kind of sucked and nobody liked him and nobody clapped immediately, hey, no big deal. Just kind of read the energy of the room, feel it out. I guess by putting it in writing, they can show the higher authorities, no, this isn't some cruel procedure. Look, we literally command that it be loving. You can even give them a hug if your Christian conscience allows for such behavior. The caption of this picture from this article gives the gist. Reflecting Jehovah's love and mercy, the congregation warmly, warmly welcomes welcome back those who have been reinstated. Sorry, I had to do that. The ultimate point they're trying to make is really just the same as the governing body update that we've already talked about. It's to give Jehovah's Witnesses the impression that the organization is becoming more loving and reasonable, even though the group hasn't gotten rid of the harmful practice that's causing the issue in the first place. We're still gonna emotionally abuse you for possibly years, but hopefully for just a few months. We learned that from uh, this guy who was definitely a Jehovah's Witness in the Bible who got reinstated because that was a thing back then. And guess what? At the end, you're way more likely to get a hug and a nice clappy now. But now we gotta get into the big stuff. The big sneaky stuff Watchtower is doing to slap a couple of band-aids on their legal lesions. Up first, judicial committees. Oh man, I, don't, I read this whole script and just realized, hey, I was in one of those judicial committees. Yeah, Jake, as uh, we mentioned over the phone, contacted you that uh, this is a judicial hearing. And uh, the, the reason for it was uh, is apostasy. Um, feel that by means of uh, the YouTube posts that uh, you're deliberately spreading false teachings and uh, even causing divisions, undermining confidence uh, of the brothers in Jehovah's arrangement. It's the most watched thing on my channel, I think, and it's kind of unfortunate because the audio is out of sync at the beginning because I didn't know what I was doing back then. I was just releasing videos because I was going crazy as a Pimo Jehovah's Witness. Well, anyway, now I feel a little silly that I went through all that because apparently judicial committees are no longer a thing. Legally speaking. Now again, before I read this, keep in mind, they're not changing the harmful practice. They're just changing the name for reasons that will seem arbitrary and whatever to Jehovah's Witnesses, but make a lot of sense for folks who know about Watchtower's massive child sex abuse scandals. In the past, these groups of elders were called judicial committees, but since judging is only one aspect of their work, we will no longer use that expression. Instead, we will simply refer to this group as a committee of elders. Now, heads up before I go any further, this next segment deals with CSA, and I'm a little more heated than in the rest of the video, so if that sounds like something you can't really deal with right now, skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. 
Now, I intend this to be a quick reaction video. I sort of throw together within a couple hours, so I'm really not well equipped to get into the full history of judicial committees as it relates to CSA. I would recommend checking out jwchildabuse.org, which has reporting on ongoing litigation against the Watchtower, breakdowns of Watchtower's tricksy legal tactics, and a lot of court documents. But you can sort of infer the problem from the name. Judicial committees are different from confession booths. Neither are good places to report CSA or any crimes, but judicial committees in the past have protected child abusers and disfellowshipped victims. Even in this article, Watchtower can't quite commit to just not allowing known child molesters back into the religion again. In certain circumstances, the elders need to be especially careful before reinstating someone. For example, if a person was guilty of child abuse or apostasy, or if he schemes to end a marriage, the elders would want to be sure that he is truly repentant. They must protect the flock. At the same time, we need to realize that Jehovah will accept back any wrongdoer who shows genuine repentance and stops engaging in wrong conduct. So although the elders exercise due caution with those who have dealt treacherously with others, they should not go so far as to say that certain types of sinners can never receive Jehovah's mercy. I probably should have just made the video about this, but this statement is outrageous. For Watchtower, an apostate is just somebody who publicly states that the governing body aren't really leading the organization or that the group doesn't really have the truth. It's just publicly criticizing the group and not relentlessly apologizing and being repentant enough to not be removed. Apostates include victims of child sexual abuse who speak up about Watchtower's harmful policies. So victims and abusers are just as bad in Watchtower's eyes. They have special punishments with extra steps to get back into Jehovah's good graces. Why can't Watchtower just say, no, sorry, and actually not sorry at all, because if you're a pedophile, you're banned for life. People get banned for life from restaurants for dine and dashing. You can't just say no to child abusers coming back, coming back again. But that, I assume, is wicked reasoning, worldly reasoning. Watchtower would say, that is God's decision. Because, you know, you don't know. Maybe God's forgiven them invisibly and secretly. And if Jehovah didn't want you to reinstate the pedophile, surely God's Holy Spirit would have intervened in some way and prevented us from doing this. Uh, okay, I can't talk about this anymore. Except for, okay, apparently, by Watchtower's logic, mind you, just as bad as being an agent of Satan and being a child abuser, just as bad is someone who has adjust glasses, schemes to end a marriage. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? It must be different from adultery because otherwise they would have just said adultery because Watchtower already has rules for adultery. It doesn't require special circumstances. So what is this scenario where a scheming con artist is trying to trick a husband and wife into ending their marriage? That's what I'm getting out of this and they don't really clarify. I, but I wanna know more about this situation. All right, now let's talk about the big change I introduced this video with. Watchtower changed the word disfellowshipping into not being a word anymore, officially. Now, witnesses are to simply say that a person has been removed. So why would they get rid of the term disfellowshipping if they're not actually going to change what disfellowshipping is? Well, this enters the realm of speculation. So just as a disclaimer and as a treat for enduring that last segment, I'm going to bring us over into uh, Jake's Conspiracy Corner. Welcome, Internet. I'm so happy to share with you this conspiracy theory. I think they're just doing this because disfellowshipping as a concept got them defunded. It has a name. It's easy to define and show as a doctrine in their little instruction manuals for elders. Disfellowshipping is an organizational practice that is enforced from the top down. And the Norwegian government was able to demonstrate this in court. Watchtower's big lie is that shunning is purely a conscience matter. And I have a whole video dedicated to debunking that. But let's just say uh, it's an obvious lie. So obvious that they say it in this article. We're going to read it. So naturally, Watchtower didn't want any of its literature to be admissible evidence. They tried to assert that like the Shepherd, the Flock of God book was essentially a holy text like the Bible. And a court isn't allowed to use something like the Bible or the Quran against you in a court case. Uh, but that argument obviously didn't hold water. So Watchtower's lawyer's entire case was blaringly contradicted by Watchtower's written materials in front of his face. I wish I had seen it myself. Watchtower can't get rid of shunning as a practice. Well, they can, if they want to be like good people and do the right thing. But if they want to keep being a cult who makes money off of free labor because of lies, they do need to keep shunning, actually. So 
they just got rid of disfellowshipping as a word or a phrase or an official doctrine. They want to imply that this is no longer a thing that they do. We don't even disfellowship anymore, you sillies. Where did you even hear that word, disfellowship? The past? That doesn't exist, uh, selectively. Watchtower has pulled this stunt before with blood transfusions. Blood transfusions are no longer a disfellowshipping offense, but they used to be. Now, after a court case, which I ideally would have looked up, but I, I am recording this sort of last minute, after some legal issues, the blood transfusee now is said to disassociate themselves, uh, but that just results in the same punishment, shunning. But I'm not sure how effective this is. All they've done by getting rid of that word is replace it with a new word. You do have to call it something. You have to be able to talk a, a little bit to describe things that are happening, so it's just it's called removal now, and the doctrine is clearly the same. It's in bold. Does what we have considered mean that we would completely ignore a person who has been removed from the congregation? Not necessarily. Certainly we would not socialize with him. So okay, they say remove now instead of disfellowshipping, but like is this a great strategy? No, your honor, we don't shun people. We just remove them and then not socialize with them except maybe to say hi at a meeting. However, we would not have an extended conversation or socialize with the individual. That's gonna help them get out of this jam. I don't know. Maybe there's some clever reason why they're doing this and people can tell me in the comments what that is. But my opinion, uh, just as a layman, I said, I think these guys are dumb. That's kind of a baseline gut check reason why I don't tend to buy into conspiracy narratives about the governing body. And that's a crazy thing to say in the conspiracy corner. So I guess by virtue of me saying that, I have to pull this right back out. Yeah, man, I've never seen the governing body be smart, ever. Have you seen their talks? These are not intelligent people. And they are certainly not so smart that they seem capable of having all sorts of complicated schemes. No, the very existence of this magazine demonstrates that this is a reactive body of proudly uneducated and narcissistic fools who through ambition and luck and self-delusion find themselves in the precarious position of steering this ship that was supposed to have arrived on shore at Armageddon since before any of the new guys were even born. One thing is clear, ex-members raising their voices about their abuse, organizing and whistleblowing to the government and the media can absolutely have an impact. Because look, it did. They're changing stuff. They're scrambling. Because of some very brave women in Norway, and at least one gentleman with some luxurious hair, a harmful practice that has been officially in place since 1954 was changed. It's in ink now. Sure, the practice is only marginally better, but first of all, it does seem like fewer miners are going to be outright disfellowshipped. And even if it just happens a little less, that's good, right? But in my opinion, the real accomplishment was getting Watchtower's abuses into the headlines, into the public consciousness. Witnesses aren't as toxic a brand as Scientology, yet, but they should be. And every time their feet are really held to the fire, these creepy cult leaders reveal themselves to be, I don't know. Losers who suck. Um, I ran out of energy writing this script. I'm sorry. What I'm saying is good job to those Norwegians. This will be the little bonus segment at the end, I think, because it doesn't really fit anywhere in the video. But this one image is kind of amazing. It says, Under divine inspiration, Paul wrote a letter directing that the unrepentant sinner be removed from the congregation. Uh, there's so many faulty premises in just this one little picture with this one little paragraph. Now, I gotta admit, I, I got a little excited uh, when I first saw this because I'm not a real Christian scholar, as uh, it's noted in the video. But I do know that Paul didn't necessarily write all of the letters attributed to him, and so I wondered if this was one of them. So I could be like, oh, he didn't even write it, uh, but he did. Scholars tend to agree that he wrote 1 Corinthians, apparently. But we definitely don't know, nor could anyone prove that anything that Paul wrote to Congress a whole long time ago was done so under divine inspiration. I mean, obviously you accept this premise if you're a Jehovah's Witness already. But also, when they're saying, under divine inspiration, Paul wrote blah 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 blah, they're saying, Paul wrote the shit that we're saying right now. Under divine inspiration, the stuff that we're saying right now was written by Paul. Watchtower's connecting all the little dots for you. It doesn't matter that he doesn't really outline the procedure that we follow in any way other than pretty vaguely to one congregation that isn't your congregation or any of our congregations because everybody that was in it was it's fucking dead uh no it applies to you because god told him to write it god knew that in 2024 they would need to slightly be able to adjust the disfellowshipping standards uh, in such a way that they keep the practice of shunning but trick those shiesty courts who were trying to you know bilk them out of their 
<laughs> Uncle Sam's dollar. Whoever, who's Uncle Sam in uh, Norwegia? Uncle Schmeingel. Watch, that'll be like a curse word in Norwegian. 